welcoming two stars. Thank <laughs> you. 
so I didn't get the role. But uh, you know, in the interim, uh, three years later, um, a director came on board in the shape of Lee Daniels, who did cast me as King, and we still just couldn't get this film off the ground. And um, I went off and did The Paperboy and the Butler with Lee in the, in the meantime, and he felt he had done his civil rights uh, film, so to speak. Um, and uh, in the meantime, I had done Middle of Nowhere with this as well, and if you think that, if, if that, you know, how that factors into the whole equation, not being from here. Well, amazing. I'm also British. <laughs> 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 I like the British idea. It's a good combo. Yeah. yeah. Um, Actually, he was correct when it turns out. Mendes, she was West African, and she went back to Mike? Um, Mike, also. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, apparently... Uh, Coretta had Mende heritage, um, so she came from Sierra Leone, West African. So I think, you know, from a physical standpoint, I felt qualified. Um, I definitely had to do a lot of research. I'd actually played Coretta previously in a production called Boycott for HBO uh, 10 years ago. And uh, so I felt like I did all the sort of traditional research at that point. I'd read all the books. I researched the period. I, I, I knew the characters. I knew the, the cast, as it were. But for this film, I think that's partly what I responded to about it, and the idea of playing the same character again, you know, it's got pros and cons, but why I fell in love with the idea was because Ava had written such a beautiful depiction of the authenticity of a marriage under distress and burden, and... It was a, it's a very different character that I have to explore ten years later. She now has more kids. Uh, they're bigger. And uh, she, the, the threat of death is so constant at this point in their lives that it really has changed the woman and the relationship in many ways. Um, as for, so as for being British Nigerian, um, I... I I think that perhaps I research even harder because I don't, I don't know the history necessarily. Um, but I think just inherently, this is as much my story as any African American story in so many ways. And more importantly, back to the script that we were making, we were really dealing with the universal themes of a marriage, which we all 
kind of perhaps or not, you know, but um, that's not necessarily dependent on where you're from. I felt somewhat qualified. <laughs> um, I mentioned this to Ava before, but I want to bring it up and ask David about this. I, I a few months ago, watched this um, 1970 Oscar-nominated documentary, King, a film record from Montgomery to Memphis. And it was like, oh, great, somebody else saw it. <laughs> Three hours of the highlights of Dr. King's speeches and appearances. And one thing that spending three hours plus with, with somebody you know, watching a film allowed me to do was sort of really study the, the look and the, and the pace of speaking and the, just every element of, of the person, I think. And I'm sure you did a lot more than three hours worth of uh, preparation, but I just have to say, having seen that and then seeing you now twice, I, it was eerie. It's unbelievable. And I just wonder if you can talk about logistically how you arrived at, you know, the nailing it. Uh, well, thank you, Scott. Um, some, you know, there's a great uh, quote from the Bible that says, an inheritance gained quickly will not be blessed in the end. <laughs> and I think that I gained a lot from a seven-year journey towards this. Um, I was desperate to do it in that first iteration. I was desperate to do it in 2010. But I know for a fact that, you know, now being of similar age to what Dr. King was in the film, having four kids myself, and having that amount of time to prepare went into exactly what you say there. Um, it's my job as an actor to study the man and, and, and all of that stuff. And thankfully, there is so much by way of footage of, of him. But what I would say is, above and beyond that, I truly mean it when I feel and I say that I was held through this process. Um, something came through me that is not of me. That, that's a, that's an odd thing to say, but I felt I had to do all the work and then take a gamble that spiritually a connection would happen that would transmit from film into an audience. Um, and I've only just fairly recently seen the film, so I'm still processing that that myself. But um, when you watch the speeches, he is taken up by something. There's something else going on other than the man himself. I know that because I'm a person of faith and I, and I have a spirituality. So we talked about that a lot. Um, in the process of it, and, and we just prepared and said, let's see what happens. And I, I have to be honest with you, magic happened. You know, things happened that at the end of the day of shooting, we would have debriefs and we'd be like, what is this? You know. Um, so, I'm still processing it, uh, but I, I did my work and I truly believe something other came and, and held us. I like that. Beginning with Carmen, I'd just like to ask, I think people may be interested to know that a lot of this was shot in places where the, the real events took place. And so for each of you, I'd be curious to know uh, how just, again, maybe it's on a spiritual level or some other level, how that impacted your jobs while you were working on a relatively tight schedule and tight budget and all the things that, I mean, this, to be doing it where things actually happen must add something to the problem. Certainly, I think it was most about originally my um, Mike. microphone. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not used to it. Okay. Um, yeah, for me, I guess being on the bridge, the Edwin Pettus Bridge, was where I felt it most viscerally. Uh, there were people that were marching with us that I understand had been there during the real 
March. Wow. Um, you feel a real sense of responsibility when you know that to be the case. Um, and, you know, there's something about that area which feels as though it's somewhat contemporized, somewhat living in a sort of space of modernity. There's something also very still, and maybe it's the water, maybe it's that river, I don't know what it is, but Selma as a town feels a little stuck in time. You know, I wonder if the name of that bridge is going to change someday, because even that Edmund Pedder's bridge, you know, as you see it, so you, you immediately go back when you look at that architecture to 1965. And so I think you can't help but be transported. Uh, so the environment definitely um, had an impact and being among people that were there doing it for real. And they did the same question to you. I know also that Congressman John Lewis, I believe, was present for some of this. And just if you can, again, the, the setting of the people, how that impacted your work. Well, like Carmen says, the, the bridge is still called Edmund Pettus Bridge, which I hope its name changes. Uh, it's named after the leader of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh my God! <laughs> yeah. Um, so, just saying. <laughs> but uh, I mean, to, to connect to what I had said earlier about being held, I remember getting a call from Mark Freeberg. The day we were going to do the very last speech on the Capitol steps in Montgomery, which is exactly where that took place. And I got an email from him saying, oh, oh sorry, I'm sorry, Mark Freeberg is our, our, our set designer, uh, genius set designer. And um, he said, I've got this lectern for you to do the speech, and it just isn't feeling right. I'm going to figure something out. And he went to Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, which is just across the way from the Capitol steps, and asked, um, do you guys have a pulpit that I could use? I think it's, it's Dr. King, we'd rather use a pulpit. And they said, well, you can't use the one in the church, it's bolted down, and you know, we can't give that to you. But just two days ago, we actually found a, a pulpit in the basement, and you can use that. And it went, fantastic. Put it up on the stage. Looked at photographs from March 1965, wow. and it was the exact same pulpit. The exact same pulpit. Found in the basement two days before a film crew hmm. come along and say, Do you guys have a pulpit? Um, Stuff like that happens almost every day. All the time. And like Carmen said on the bridge, marching with people who actually march. Do you know what it feels like for someone who's 70 something years old to come up to you and say, I was there on the day. You're doing good, brother. You're doing good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you actually have some family ties to the area, right? So that was. Yeah. Now, everyone I love most in the world lives in um, Side State. <laughs> and all my cats and collaborators, but my family, my mother and father, and my four brothers and sisters all live in Montgomery, Alabama. My father is from Lowndes County, Alabama, which is the backwoods, and I have a bunch of people waiting from wooded areas. Those are kind of the backwoods of Lowndes County, they call it the Little Lowndes because there's so much bloodshed, um, yeah. so much terrorism with black people in back in those backwoods. And, and so my father is from there, which is another crazy thing that this film. Lands and lilacs. So, so for me, in terms, terms of the real places, places the, the place Selma was really the entry point for me. You know, I said, the film's not called King, it's called Selma. Selma. So, that so that was really my entry point. point. I know that place. My mom works in Selma. She drives from my memory in Selma every day for the last seven years to work. work. She passes over that bridge to go to work every single day. Once we were scouting the bridge with our set of proper graphic and our editors to our every folks, did a great job. And, and a lady just pops the horn and waves us. I'm like, that's, that's nice. nice. A few people so much. Welcome to this. It's like, oh, that's my mom. So that was really, that's really the entry point for me. So the whole thing felt like it was on kind of pop ground, because that's my father's birthplace. And I think that's a lot of people who are in Selma that have been there for a long time. So I want to turn this to the fact that you can have a great story, a great script, great talent involved, everybody, uh, everything on your side, but you do need 
people with some dough to believe in you when you want to tell a story like this. And, and you guys had some very uh, interesting, high-profile folks that, that signed up for the ride with you. And uh, I just wonder if you can share uh, what it what it was like and how helpful it was and in what ways, I guess, even, Ava, to have uh, A, the, the Plan B folks who last year produced 12 Years a Slave, that's Brad Pitt's production company with Jeremy Kleiner and Dean Gardner, and then Miss Winfrey with Arco Films, and just all these folks who, you know, they, they can, they have sort of the pick of the litter of any project they want, and they signed up to work with you guys. How was that helpful? Yeah. Well, well what's this special David? David, David has worked, worked with years and years with the plan these side and things to just talk about their kind of very, you know, years, years long commitment to the film. For me, I came in a month, month within the same, same month that Oprah came, came on. And, and, um, and, and she has changed, changed my life, life my worldview, my, world my energetic force field, field that she goes <laughs> in so many ways. <laughs> Um, you know, you know she, she was such, such a hands-on producer. I thought to myself, like, she was a nice woman. She's the Oak Winfrey. She had tweeted about, about our, our previous film, Little Nowhere. She gave us a little attention, and I thought, oh, what a... Never thought she came on a producer that I would actually speak with her every single day. That she would come to the set as often as she did. That she would just really clear the path for us in a lot of difficult, difficult situations. I mean, really, you know, I, I described before, is I really see her, her it's like, like a jungle at some, some point. And she was just hacking away at everything, and it was just followed behind her. She just really, <laughs> really, <laughs> and really, really seriously um, moved mountains to make this happen so that me, as, as a black woman director, had, this, this is the film I wanted to make with no compromises. No, this is the thing we're going to make. That's how hard it is for a director who's not done it for looks like me to have that wherewithal. It's because she gave it to me. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, I get emotional talking about her, but in every way that a physical producer could be there for the bond company calls, to the cast, whatever, she was there. There's also this other element of, of a real, um, she was just like a guardian angel to us in a lot of ways. Really amazing. More than I ever dreamed. Yeah, and you know, just to jump on on that, when Ava had come on board to, to the project and was rewriting the script, and like I say, I had been on the project for a while, and there was this cycle of this is the amount of money we can make it for, this is the amount of money that it can feasibly actually be made for, and it was always about 20% less than what the film could actually be made for. And, and what we would always get is, is oh, but this is, you know, you know a, a black film, no, no foreign, da, 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 all that, <laughs> would, 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 would come up. And, and there, there was this gap. gap. Now, now, it took a, a director who knows how to make, to make films, films with two paper clips and then a set <laughs> or two <laughs> to, to give confidence. But, but we were starting to slip into, into that situation, situation again. And, and I had played Oprah's son in, in The Butler. And, and to be perfectly, perfectly frank, frank, it was, it was a call that man. went, Mama, <laughs> need your help. <laughs> and um, thankfully, you know, she answered the call and like Ava said, was, was the difference maker. But also, you know, Plan B, who, like you say, did 12 Years a Slave recently, stuck with that project for eight years. Um, and a determination that this film should exist. And what the lie that had stopped it from happening for all that time was that people don't want to see a film like this, there's no foreign value in it. Films that were being made around this subject matter would always have white protagonists with black peripheral characters. Um, and it wasn't until The Butler and 12 Years a Slave came along, and both did in the region of $200 million each, whilst doing very good foreign, that to be perfectly frank, in terms of the industry, excuses were just run out of. Um, and so, the Plan B's determination to stay on board for that long, plus the sheer atom bomb that is Oprah Winfrey in terms of... <laughs> power and propulsion 
uh, led to this. So, you know, these are people who have power using it in a beautiful way. Last question is, in some ways, I suspect the, the hardest uh, to, to really answer for anybody, but I'll, because you've all immersed yourself so much in, in studying Dr. King and the history of this, and then also bring your own history to, to this project, I've got to ask you, if by some miracle Dr. King was able to rejoin us here today and look at the world in 2014, where on the one hand, you have Barack Obama in the White House, John Lewis in Congress, uh, Oprah Winfrey, the most powerful woman in perhaps the world. But on the other hand, uh, we, you know, we, we also have um, you know, a lot of tension in the sense of what's happened with Trayvon Martin, what's happened with Michael Brown, what's still going on in Ferguson, the fact that there's a lot of disenfranchisement around the country and a huge numbers of a uh, disproportionate number of incarceration and all of that. Uh, what would he make of it? What do you make of it? Do you have any, is it your hope that this film will uh, be a part of that dialogue? Taylor? Uh, I was going to say Dr. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Um, he was a, he was a, he was a smart, wise man. I don't think that he thought that the dream would be easily achieved in the receipt of the trenches, he lost his life over this. And, and so, yes, yes, I mean, we, we've been advanced in many ways, but I think it's towards, towards the end, end of his life, life he was really talking, talking about economic empowerment, he was talking about structures, he was talking about, about systems. systems. His, his view of what's, what's going to take to dismantle racism and oppression starts to change more and become very comprehensive and multi-layered. And, um, and, and I think when you start to analyze the industrial, industrial complex and so many of the different systems, systems that are set up against people of color, color women, all kinds of people, um, you start to know that it, it most likely will be something that's going to be there all the time. That we can lay foundations, that we can change and take personal responsibility, that we can affect one, one each one, teach one. one. Um, that some of us who are special like him will be able, able to reach the masses. But, but um, having, having studied him so closely, closely the, the writings towards, towards the end of his life, life speeches, his, his writings, um, I, think I think he knew that it was going to be a long tail. Right. Right. And, and so, so you know, the, the pride of, of, of our, our black president, president you know, mixed with the, the, the sorrow and pain of some of the things that are still happening, happening in, our in our communities, I don't think we can expect that That's That's my opinion. I think, though, that you know, when, when tragedies, tragedies and, 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 and national, national moments of discontent happen, happen like we're going right now with Ferguson, happen, happen there's a, an, an organic, organic unity that happens that I've found as a member of the black community very beautiful. And, and um, um, so there's just some beauty in the pain. pain. And it's, and it's not, not just black, black people, people, people all colors come together, together to say that, that is not right, right. we we'll stand against it. It's the same thing that you saw here on Turn Around Tuesday. Tuesday. Having, having a beautiful, beautiful conversation with people of all colors now. There's just nothing to spark the conversation for. So us as Americans, Americans like, like that, that happen and we keep going. That's, That's why this whole Black Friday, Friday moment of like, let's take a moment and talk about it instead of shop. Right. That's what some people were talking about. about. Like, we need to take a minute to process the pain. So I think, um, I think, um, I think it's, it's a lot of work it was for the end of his life, what I've studied. And um, I don't think he'd be surprised at where we are now. Well, I, I think the reality is, um, I, I agree exactly with what you say. He was a pragmatic man. Um, and there are incredible things that have happened, but the truth of the matter is we have two Americas. We have the America in which we can have a black president who has served two terms. We now have an America whereby, for me, one of the most beautiful things I experienced shooting Selma was to see Ava DuVernay and Oprah Winfrey behind a monitor on a $20 million movie um, about Dr. King. Um, that was just so beautiful to me. Sexism existed within the civil rights movement. Um, women were marginalized, even within a movement that was about inequality and injustice. So for you to direct that film, <laughs> and to highlight Annie Lee Cooper, to highlight Diane Nash, mm. to highlight Amelia Boynton, to highlight Coretta Scott King is beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's part of the best of us. 
Um, obviously, Ferguson is the other side. And these two Americas I'm talking about is to do with the truth of the matter is we're being given a message that black, black life is of less value. That's what Trayvon Martin, to me, stands for. That's what Michael Brown stands for. And until there is a consensus that that is a lie from the two Americas, until humanity within America comes together to say that all life is equal, all skin color is of value, men and women, then the dream will be elusive. Um, but, but the, the thing, thing that, that Dr. Dr. King talked about, that I think is our greatest hope, is, is love. <coughs> to love people into looking in the mirror and see the shame of what they're doing is what he spoke of. Sacrificial love, putting yourself on the line for other people. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his friend. That, to me, is what I think he would be still saying today. That love is what I think is ultimately going to get us there, probably beyond our lifetimes. And strategy. You know, what we try to show in this film is that there was tactical, intelligent thinking as to how to overcome these obstacles. And I do think we are lacking the leadership and strategy, and also the taking up of the beauty of what was won in Selma. The erosion of the Voting Rights Act is one thing, but to then not vote, you know, to then not vote is a, a, a criminal. It's a denigration of what, of what was won. And there are all sorts of reasons why that, that, that is happening, but my prayer is that the film reminds us of what we won, how far we've come, what there is to do, and how we have been empowered by these great heroes that went before us. Yeah, I think um, something that the film reminds us of beautifully is that participation is, is everything. I think Martin Luther King as a leader had a community of people that were willing to not shop on a Friday or whatever it took, to, to, to march for 50 miles, to be beaten in the streets, to risk their lives and to take, to really do what it took to make change. I think there's a degree of apathy in, in our lives these days, which is why people aren't as compelled to vote, perhaps. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons for that that are legitimate and justified. But I think to get back to a place which is what makes me so excited about being part of this film, is to be reminded that you have to be participatory from a grassroots level right up to the president. We all have to be committed to some kind of degree of change for it to happen um, with intelligence, with strategy um, and mindfulness and always with love. Mm. You guys are fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, that's what I was just trying to find. What a beautiful film. Yes, it was. And as a white person to a black actor, I just am so proud of Ethan. She's amazing. She's amazing.
Thank you. Okay. That is needs to be said again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you know, That's great. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate that compliment. Thank, thank you. you. When's it coming out? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you for that. Appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Roman is his soul. What's the name of the other one?
interesting to me is if I were the one that was getting the comments and the stress. And so, for whatever it is,